session is uh, Sharon Burke, who's the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy. She's also, she runs the Resource Security Program at New America. Uh, and uh, she and Louis Palau will be discussing uh, the future of conflict uh, in the Arctic in 2030. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Peter, and I'm always delighted to be here at your conference and as part of the New America team. So, there. we have uh, some pictures for you, and I'm going to introduce my guest in just a moment, um, whenever the slide comes up. Will we be able to see when it's up? Uh, we're going to start with a poll, so get your thumbs ready. We have a polling question for you, which uh, I, I can't see if it's up. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So the question, which I also cannot see, is what, oh, what is the state of conflict in the Arctic in 2030? So use your imaginations. Multilateral peace arrangement, A. B is US and allies dominate. C, Russia dominates. D, war between the great powers. So give us your honest answer right now, and the texting instructions are up there at the top. And in real time, we should be able to see your answers. It'll give Louie and I a great starting point, so uh, we look forward to your participation. Um, while you're voting, I'm just going to take a minute to introduce my guest here. Louis Palau is an award-winning photojournalist and documentarian. Um, he often covers conflicts. You'll have to explain to us why. But he spent five years embedded in Kandahar, so five years. Uh, he's covered the uh, drug wars in Mexico, in fact, as a New America Fellow at the time, I believe. Um, he's just finished a documentary on Ukraine. So he's a very experienced photojournalist in these areas. And the reason he's here with us today is that he's also covered the Arctic. And I will tell you more about that in a moment. We're watching your po poll results come in. US and allies dominate, 36%. So an interesting distribution, though. I would say. It keeps changing. <laughs> it keeps changing. It's like watching an election. <laughs> sort of. Um, OK. How interesting. Wow. You're not sure. <laughs> it's As the a caffeine. collective, the one thing you don't think, only 13% think a war between the great powers in the Arctic in 2013. Um, otherwise, wow, look at that. Russia dominates. This is like a game of risk. All right. I'm about to cut you off, so last, last chance to vote. All right. Look at that, the war between the great powers. Oh, it's going down, it's going up. OK, let's call it at that. Um, an interesting result. Multilateral peace arrangement is the top. Um, Russia dominates more than U.S. and allies a photo of that for It's like very tempting to skew the voting by making comments on how you're voting, but we'll get there. Okay. So that's great. Let's go to the, to the opening for our presentation, to the first slide. Okay. So the Arctic. There's a little delay when the slide, when yes. like the clicker. I'm going to start talking, and soon, oh, there think, we go. Yeah. OK, so this is an actual photograph from the polar orbiting satellite. Um, it was the first picture from the, polar orbi the new polar orbiting satellite that NOAA posted last year in 2018. That is the North Pole in winter. That is the Arctic. And of course, what you can't see in the middle of winter is that since 1979, with the satellite measurements, the Arctic has lost 40% of its ice. It is melting faster than at any time in recorded history. It is now the projections have been updated. It's believed that the Arctic will be ice-free in the summer months as soon as 2030. So think about where you were in 2009, 2008, and how recent that seems to you. This is going to be ice-free in the summer months by 2030. Now, of course, an Arctic summer is a whole other thing, right? You're talking about three weeks in September, so don't get too excited. We're going to get there. Yeah. So as I said, I'm very fortunate to have Louis Palou here as my guest. 
He's a phenomenal photojournalist who has covered conflict in many theaters. He's very experienced at this. Well, for National Geographic, a forthcoming issue in the fall, he went to the Arctic. He was embedded in the Arctic. Um, so he's going to tell us more about what he saw. And more to the point, he's going to show us what he saw. This is an unusual point of view. We see these pictures, often with a red line that shows you just how much the ice has retreated and what that means. So what does it mean? It means an entirely new theater of operations, not just for the five littoral states and the three near littoral states, but for lots of others, including China. Uh, the Coast Guard put out a brand new strategy last week that's pretty forward-leaning and aggressive for the Coast Guard especially, that starts on the first page by mentioning there's a trillion dollars worth of minerals in this area, a billion dollars worth of undiscovered oil, 30% of the world's remaining natural gas is in this region. A billion dollars, I think, in fishing. Um, a million square miles of US territory. Um, and a whole new ocean to patrol, a whole new transpolar route, which is why the Chinese are so very interested and have made many scientific moves through the region. The Russians have 50% of the ocean, of the Arctic coastline, I believe, and the northern sea route. They have something like 40 heavy icebreakers. And last week, the US Congress, I believe, approved a new heavy icebreaker for the United States. That's $700 million. So the Arctic, some people are saying, a lot of people in this room may be thinking, it's the new great game. But Louis has a really unusual point of view on this, because he's literally been on the ground. This is ground truth. So we're going to hear from him now and what he has to say. OK, first of all, Louis, tell us what brought you to the Arctic, from Kandahar and Ukraine and all these places, what made you go there and when did you start going there? I, I've always been interested in geographic spaces and how people compete for these geographic spaces and what the reality is when you hit it and all the best laid plans don't come to pass Yeah. and looking at history. And so in 1993 when I arrived, these are the three things kind of going on. Uh, there was a diamond discovery. I got sent up there in 1993. It's multi-billion dollar mining now in, in Canada. No one ever thought there'd be diamonds in Canada. It was always thought they'd be in Africa or other parts of the world. Uh, I arrived and there had been a bombing. A <laughs> miner planted a bomb and killed nine people at a gold mine during a labor dispute. So when we think about conflict and security, it's more than just like big armies lining up to have a battle. Security is a lot of different things. There are local security so considerations. How do you, you think, how do people usually imagine the Arctic as a place where people Polar have? Polar bears, ice, and no one lives there, and outdated ideas of indigenous people mostly. Um, and then a year later, Canada opens fire on a Spanish fishing vessel. Right. Over, and it just talked about resources and competition for resources. So tell us where you went. This is a map of places okay. that Louis has been or is going to be. So that was 93, just on this project. The red lines, I've sailed most of the Northwest Passage. Uh, I've made about 28 field trips, some being several months, some, some on foot, some with uh, local Inuit soldiers, uh, snowmobiles, you name it, I've been on it. The red is where I've been. The green is up what's upcoming. The blue is past trips that relate, that relate to this. And the green is what's coming up next. So. And so what do most people think of when they think of this region? They have an image in their minds? They have, they have invented uh, narratives, usually, because what I find the Arctic is a place that's defined by what our desires want it to be. We want it to be about oil. Oh, we better hurry up and go up there and get ready for the oil, where most of the oil is inaccessible, we you know where it is. I also think that uh, the Arctic is this blank slate for invented narratives. Blank. There's lots of mining. It's like m most of the resources are on people's country's land already. Right. So I think that that's, that's what I think uh, we need to keep in mind. It's, it's an, a lot of invented narratives. Because the Arctic, it's an unprecedented moment. Unlike other places in the world where there's our histories, like when I went to Afghanistan, we'd hear centuries of history. This is how it was for this country. This is how it was for the British or the Russians. There is no this is how it was for the Arctic. So tell us what it looks like on the ground, ground truth, as a potential theater of operations. You know, tell so, us what we're looking at. Uh, I'm on a Dan Danish Navy vessel here outside the Lusiat Fjord. This is the fjord actually where the iceberg that sank the Titanic came from. <laughs> so you, know, there's, you, get, you get out there, and uh, best laid plans never go according to plan. And I also think that if you're training for the military to go in the Arctic, no matter what you're doing, you can't just do a year of training and 
pass it on to the next person. It's decades and centuries of knowledge that you have to pass on. Oh, so, so like this is what we would call ice free, right? It's, it's yeah, not this is, this ice, is an ice That's ice free, yeah. Right. That's, so tell us what this is. This is uh, just near Fort Greeley in Alaska. Alaska's, I call it the largest unsinkable aircraft carrier in the world. It's like this <laughs> big peninsula of the, the military uh, presence there is huge and they're constantly training. It, it just talks about all the Sir, this is US paratroopers, Army, right? US Army, yeah. Right. And it's just all, these, all this planning and training. And in the end, the ultimate power in the world is not military, but nature up there. So you're saying these guys can't just literally drop in. They have to be training up there all the time. Well, you could, yeah, and it's constant training. It's not, you can't just do basic training and suddenly appear in the Arctic. I mean, when it's minus 60, try starting a snowmobile. So tell us what that looks like, minus 60. So it feels like to Yeah, be there. and then, you know, like these are U.S. Marines and Green Berets training to go to Norway. This is in uh, Barrow. And it's about two months of darkness. So you can't just plan about technical stuff. You've got to plan about emotional and psychological effects on your troops and can they operate every day and are they from a part of the United States that makes them even possible to operate in the Arctic. So it's an incredibly harsh climate, right, that's true. We're, yeah. He's from Canada, so he, he knows what that's like. I'm from Los Angeles, my family's from the Mojave Desert, this is scary for us. <laughs> well, I, I'm the kind of guy, I, went ice, I grew up ice fishing as a kid, so jumping in the water and the ice is seem normal to me, but. But even you, 60 below, so this, this climate is going to be harsh for a long time. Well, well, it's a part of the world where the air can kill you. I mean, it's minus 60. There's no other place in the world really other than Antarctica where the air can kill you. And this is this also is a pilots training? pilots training. Mostly some of these pilots are fighter pilots. These are Canadian, UK, and French training in Resolute Bay. There's a special training area up there. It's one of the most gnarly training areas in the world. And, and what it is is, if you sweat too much, you can die. And th these are all these parts of, the, of knowledge you need to learn to operate up there that I think is beyond just going to basic training and then going up operating in the Arctic. I've seen a lot of really skilled war fighters go up to the Arctic and not want to be there anymore or not being able to operate up there because the air gives you frostbite. I mean, there's a lot of things to, to understand. So who's important for them? Well, so you, you should say what we're looking at here, but also this is search and clue. rescue training. This is in Clyde River. Uh, Canada has and has had for a long time uh, a lot of uh, an Inuit reservist unit called the Canadian Rangers, and uh, they're in every community. And you think of community-based security and community-based knowledge, not far different from having key leader engagements, understanding elders in Afghanistan. It's the same thing. You know, the the Inuit are the greatest scientists of the Arctic. They have observational facts and oral histories that talk about what's changing and how things are up there for centuries. So uh, I spent months with Inuit soldiers in the Arctic. And that's what this is as well, yeah, right? Yeah, so Canada's military has integrated uh, indigenous knowledge into training for survival and understanding the environment that they're working in. It's kind of mandatory training. They also have a course called the Arctic Operations Advisors course. And you're seeing the renewal of interest in cold weather training in Alaska as well is this is becoming a part of operations in the Arctic. So let's go full circle and come back to the polling question. So there's a lot of attention about, you know, Russia's got all these icebreakers, they're putting down new bases or rehabbing their old bases. Um, the United States, new icebreaker. The Canadians, of course, have mm -hmm. long history, along with indigenous populations of operating and training in the region. Who wins by 2030? You know, is it going to be the Russians? Is it going to be the U.S. and allies? Or from what you said, the Arctic itself wins by 2030. It's a difficult place it, to operate. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the most powerful weapon or tool in the Arctic is this nuclear submarine. I don't need an icebreaker. I'll just sail under the ice. So, or air power. I mean, I can fly anywhere. I have to say I've done a lot of stuff with the U.S. Air Force. A lot of incredible knowledge retained there, even for supporting scientists to do research, because only the US Air Force can get to certain places, like say in Greenland. So I, I think that this idea, again, I would just, everybody needs to understand for me, if there's ever a battle space, or I don't even like using that, because the idea of a shooting war in the Arctic is almost preposterous to me. Why? Because people will, I have this great quote from a general op, Joint Task Force North. If anyone tried attacking over the pole, it'd be the largest search and rescue operation in the history of the world. <laughs> now, I know that there are northern projections of power, but there are anxieties over the continued east-west tensions. 
and that involves, the Arctic is a very big place, but the Arctic is a hundred different places. The Arctic in Finland, I could drive a really nice car from my hotel in, right into the Arctic and I can go do yoga in the morning. In Canada, you can't do that. You know, the Arctic is a lot of different places. So it is about invented narratives and you need to be careful that some of those invented narratives are part of military strategies from other countries to suck you into a place where you can't operate or waste your resources. So you think, in other words, by 2030, the reality of this place is not going to be significantly different. No, and it's the it's greatest. It's a very harsh theater of operations. It is, and it, it is the, the greatest place of the unknowns on the planet. And our ability, for the United States, our ability to operate up there is, is unchanged in the sense that it's been, for some time now, submarines and air power, largely. Yeah, I, I think that. But so you said search and rescue, and I know that was a, a a joke and a comment yeah. on the aspirations. But in fact, that is one of the growing missions up there because you can get, especially through the Northern Sea Route, but yeah. in, you've gone through the Northwest Passage, right? Yeah. yeah. What was that like? Uh, I think there were five May Days within the first week I was up there from everything from, I'm not kidding, a Spanish, no, it's not Spanish, Mexican sail, sailing boat. They thought they could sail through up there and they hit up. It, and then a, a cruise ship with scientists got stuck because things aren't mapped out, out up there. Um, I, I, I think that uh, th there are ideas floated around, and sometimes I think we think it's about fighting other countries, but I also think it's about the military can protect the environment. Everybody talks about oil. I think fishing is going to come is going to be far more important. It's food. It's what we really need. Right. Uh, there's no alternative to food. There's alternative to oil, uh, and I think that. What, is, what does a country think of their economy when an, someone else who has lower environment, environmental standards sails and leaks oil into someone's fishing grounds and affects that? Or someone fishes just off your 200 mile limit and starts depleting your fish stocks like what collapsed the cod fishery in Canada in the 90s? So this is a place of unknowns and the trajectory it follows is almost, <laughs> the only thing we can be certain of is it's not gonna be what we expect. As a, as a longtime defense community person, the last thought I want to leave you with is that 2030 ice-free in the summer still means it's a very harsh environment that's mostly frozen most of the time. If it does melt faster and sooner, I would just remind my national security colleagues, don't forget what that actually means. This is climate change. And if it's happening faster, you've got bigger problems than the transpolar route that's opening up. I want to leave you with that thought. And Louis, thank you so much Thanks. for sharing your Thanks. ground truth with us. Thanks.